Hi, I'm Melissa Smith. And I'm Serena Halstead. And I'm Spencer Ziegler. And welcome to Data Lit. And we're now in the back half of our Working with Data series. Um, the first half of it, we looked at a lot of different concepts. In these next few episodes, we're going to talk to county staff uh, to get a sense of what this looks like in the day-to-day -day operations within our school system. And we were thinking, who better to talk about data with than our wonderful MTSS coaches? So today, we are thrilled to be joined by Sandy Carter and Mickey Gerganis. So, Sandy, Mickey, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah happy to be here. And let's, uh, let's get started. Sandy, can you tell us a little bit about your position, what you all do? So, MTSS is multi-tier system of support. So, as coaches, our roles and our goals are to support skillful modeling of academic and behavior data-based problem solving using tips, which Mick is going to talk more, more about later. Another goal is to support the three-tiered instruction and intervention model with a primary focus on tier one core academics and behavior to support the alignment between school improvement and MTSS and to increase understanding of how they're connected so that our schools, our, our teams don't feel like they're focusing on school improvement and then focusing on MTSS because MTSS helps with school improvement. And also to provide strategic and relevant professional learning to support MTSS implementation and to support schools with using fidelity tools to assess how they're implementing, how it's going with implementing MTSS. And that's using the FAMS, which is the facilitated assessment of MTSS implementation, our walkthrough data, tiered fidelity, inventory, et cetera. So we use those tools to kind of help our schools to assess, you know, as we're going along, how are we really doing with MTSS implementation? Hi, thank you for that overview. And, and for listeners, the MTSS coaches are fantastic and an invaluable resource. So make sure you're tapping into them. And as we're talking today, one of the things I find, I think in education in general, but especially when we talk about some of these processes, it's it can be kind of alphabet soup at times. There are just so many acronyms. So we're thinking, uh, Mickey, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to do sure. some rapid fire quiz, uh, throw some acronyms at you, and sure. uh, then you define it for us. So when they okay. pop up later, we're, we're familiar with it. So let's yep. start. Well, MTSS, what is that? Yeah, I would go back and uh, joke with you, Spencer. Yeah, in education, we have a whole lot of uh, acronyms and we, we throw them at teachers a lot. So I appreciate the opportunity. MTSS is that multi-tiered system of support and it is a uh, tiered framework which promotes improvement using uh, academic and behavior practices. It also is um, we're adding in that social emotional learning piece. Mm -hmm. And it's a systems approach in which we database problem solving to think about how are we maximizing growth and ensuring success for all students. Under that MTSS framework, there are six critical components. You have leadership, mm -hmm. you have your communication and collaboration, you have that building the capacity infrastructure for implementation, you have database problem solving, which is really one of the biggest ones of all, and then you have your three-tiered instruction intervention model, and finally, uh, data evaluation. I think our schools are most familiar and our teachers are most familiar with that three-tiered instruction intervention yeah. model. But one of the things I will say is MTSS is much more than just intervention. We, uh, we sometimes assume that MTSS is intervention or it is a gateway to special ed. It's about how we're using all of those critical components to maximize a continuous school improvement for schools. Yeah, that is perfect overview. Okay, so that's MTSS. How about, uh, there's one that I heard is your chat and uh, DBPS. That's one that pops up from time to time as well. What's that? Yeah, it's one of our uh, most essential components, and that's that database problem solving. And that's where we're we're walking through and we're looking at our data and we're deciding how is that data impacting the outcomes for students. And I would put a caveat in there to say that it is not always academic data that we're looking at. You may be looking at behavior data. Mm -hmm. You may be looking at processes, uh, structures in the school, what's working, not what's not working. But it's walking through that process of what data do we have how are we analyzing the data and how is that data impacting the growth for our school as well as our students? So it's good to see that. I like that Mickey talks about, if we refer back to that episode where we talked about types of data, mm -hmm. we talk about student learning data, we talked about 
process data at schools. Yeah. Yes. So it's good to see that. And then the behavior data again. Yeah to see that the different types of data are resonating again when you come to look at school improvement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and sometimes when we're talking about, I guess, the room which we look at data, we'll hear the acronym ISIL. Can you tell us what does ISIL stand for? Yep. So if you've gone through the database problem solving steps, and we can talk about that later on, but when you've identified those root causes and you think about what are those root causes, you also want to think through the lens of ISIL. That's your instruction. That's how you're teaching. The curriculum is the what. The environment is the where. And finally, the learner. I think one of the most common mistakes that schools make and we tend to make as educators is that we want to put the learner first. We want to assume that that all of the issues are lying with the learner. And we joke and say, if you put the L in front of the ice, you get lice and nobody wants that. So we really want to think about that idea of let's look at our instruction, our curriculum, and our environment before we assume that whatever issue that is rising is because of the learner. Because, you know, sometimes the learner comes to us and they come with issues that is out of our control, but the ICE are things that we can control and what we do to help them do that to, that will impact the learner. And then sometimes I think when we're talking about validating data, we'll hear the acronym RIOT. What does yes. that mean for that? So once you've uh, figured out those root causes, then you want to go through the process to figure out how are we going to validate are all of these possible root causes true or some of them not true. So we go through a process where we review, we interview, we observe, or we test. And one of the things that Sandy and I and the MTSS coaches will say to our teams when we're going through this process is you don't have to do all four. You do what you need to do. And another thing I'd like to say is with this process, you've already got the data that you need. You, so you may not need to go and collect new pieces or data or new surveys. The, uh, the review, the interview, the observe and test is a process that you go through to validate those root causes. And some of those root causes may be invalidated. In fact, I've worked with schools before where we've invalidated all of the root causes and we start mm. the process over again then we get we really narrow that focus down and figure out this is what's causing that problem to occur and this is what we can do to address those issues. So it sounds like a process for like analyzing your data then. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's really about those root causes and validating them and, and what do you do to go through to validate this is why this problem is occurring. And Mickey, on that note of um, the problem occurring, so I know Spencer said he had a couple of I have just one. Yes. So one more acronym. Can you briefly describe what the TIPS, the US TIPS model, what is yep. that? Can you explain that to me some more? Yep, that's another one of our acronyms. So <laughs> the TIPS model is really just a model for database problem solving. And the TIPS acronym is Team Initiated Problem Solving Model. Uh, we call it TIPS for short. And again, I will say this is something that can be used for any piece of data that you have. And it's really one, of, it's a cyclical process. And so if you think about it, the center of that circle is where you're collecting and analyzing data. And as you go through all the stages, you're constantly going back to that data, analyzing it. So the first thing you do in the TIPS process is uh, after you've analyzed your data, you look at it and you say, let's identify our problem. Mm -hmm. Then you go through the next step of, okay, this is the problem. Let's think about what's causing those root causes. And we go through and validate those root causes. And once you've done that, then it goes into the next phase, which is develop a hypothesis. And after you develop that hypothesis, then you think about what are some possible solutions that we can put into place that will address our hypothesis, our, our problem. You put those into place and then you develop and implement your action plan. Here are our problem, these are our solutions, now let's put our plan into place. How are we going to address that? And finally, the last thing you do is give it some time and then go back and look at it and say, is it working? The final stage of the tips is let's evaluate our plan and we might even need to revise our plan because it's not working and we might need to think about doing some different solutions to address it. So it's really that cyclical process that schools go through to think about here's our problem, putting it into place and let's go back and revise that plan. So it's a multi, it's a multi-layer step uh, pro, uh, process. 
Yeah. It's the acronym quiz. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> we're going to test you after we're done just to say it. I feel like I'm an undergraduate school when we had those <laughs> quizzes where you had to like identify what all these um, yeah. acronyms stand well, for. Let's, let's throw in it DNA. Do you recall what DNA stands for? <laughs> yeah. That one, I don't. I know. <laughs> I don't like, Sandy, what do you got? acid. There we go. Okay. Y'all, y'all got 100. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from being in the classroom, um, I remember when it was RTI, RTII, mm-hmm. and then MTSS. And I, I always, you know, when I'm working with my PLT, I always like that whole process of going through. But I know that many times my colleagues and I, we went from, we got the data, mm-hmm. we came up with a hypothesis that tended to involve the learner, and then we had a ton of action, right? And so we jumped straight from the data into action. So can you explain to, to me and to, to listeners, like, why is it important to walk through the whole entire process? Okay, so how PLTs are using tips instead of just like doing what you did? <laughs> what yeah. you did. So you guys had the Oscar Rogers method from Saturday Night Live. Y'all remember him? You identify <laughs> the problem, fix it. Find another problem, fix it. On Saturday Night Live, Oscar Rogers, I mean, that was his thing. Yeah. But we need, let's just back up. Let's just pull the Oscar Rogers out of us and get throw him away. It's more important now than ever to effectively identify what's really going on with our instruction, um, the effectiveness of our instruction, the health of our core, and to make the best database decisions to ensure that all of our students get what they need to be successful. Unlike Oscar Rogers, we don't want to just, oh, yep, here's a problem, fix it. We mm-hmm. want to take the steps, take a step back, take a look at, a good look at the big picture. We have to do that in order to fix the problem. What's the data telling us? What's the data not telling us? What are the implications of both? And so tips, as, as Mickey expressed, you know, team-initiated problem solving, that helps our POTs, another acronym, but it wasn't our fault, <laughs> um, <laughs> To see the big picture, to dig down to root causes, and to answer those questions. What's the data saying? What's the data not saying? Our PLTs start with tips by reviewing multiple data points to identify the broad problem. Then they brainstorm and prioritize the suspected root causes using ISIL. They want to have all, you're going to, you know, and anything's fair game when you're looking at the broad problem. You know, what do you think is causing it? And now let's prioritize it based on instruction, curriculum, environment, and the learner. And then we want to, uh, once we prioritize those, figure out the ones that we have control over, the ones that are going to have the biggest impact. You're going to look at those through a lot of different lenses. Which ones can we implement implement right now? Which ones are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck right now? Which one's going to be the most impactful right now? And then we use the data, like he said, we're creating a hypothesis using those suspected root causes. And then we're going to validate them, like he said, using Riot, review, interview, observe, and test. And then with that data, we're determining if what we suspect is really causing the problems we see, because we don't want to create solutions and implement interventions for root causes that are not actually the problem. If our plan isn't working, we probably haven't identified the right problem. So if we don't actually address the real root cause, we'll never solve the problem. And once our POTs have a validated hypothesis, we now have a precise problem. And that's where we want to start posing the solutions, not from the broad problem, but from the validated root cause. An example I like to give is I can mow my lawn every day from now on. But if I've got weeds, they're never going away unless I get the root up. Once I address the root, then that problem goes away. And so that's what we have to Help our um, help our teams, help our teachers, whoever's wanting to do the database problem solving process. In those PLTs, we have to help them be able to do that and not skip over the ISO piece because that's like the meat, the nuts and bolts of the tips model. Yeah, I appreciate how you you point out just the the efficiency of using these systems because yes, they are an investment in time, but they're one that, like you said, is going to give you the the biggest bang for your bucks. So that we're not just chasing stuff that doesn't exactly have a root problem. I think that's that's an important point to consider when teachers are thinking about 
you know, using the tips model to really figure out what's going on. Sandy, trying to uh, like the the analogy that you use about mowing your lawn. Mm-hmm. And so I know, you know, as teachers, I like how you started off with about the need to step back. And so in a lot of times in my career, when I step back, I do recognize that there are hypotheses that we come up with that are based on biases that we have about students yeah. more than it is about the actual data, right? Because you can, right. based on your biases and your beliefs about students, can that can affect how you interpret the data. Oh, and yeah. so can you share with me how this TIPS model can help a teacher or PLTs circumvent some of our, some of our biases that we might have? Okay. Um, excellent question. And the key to tips I like to point out is team. Mm-hmm. And the team affords us a lot of different lenses looking at the data. So by problem solving as a team and using ISIL, we have the opportunity to address implicit and explicit biases when determining the scope of the problem. Okay. Is this just occurring in my classroom? Mm-hmm. Is it just occurring in certain subgroups? across my grade level, even across the school. And this helps us determine if it may be impacted by systemic or explicit biases or something we need to take a closer look at as individual, which would be implicit biases. Mm -hmm. And as a team, we can identify trends or other factors that might be influencing outcomes. And that's where you might see some of those biases come to the surface and we're like, oh, wait, you know, for example, if 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 everybody on my team's data looks one way and then mine looks totally different, that's going to give me pause to say, hmm, is there something I'm not doing? Is there some way that I'm reacting or interacting as something in my instructional practices in the environment that I've created that might be adversely impacting certain groups of students? And part of that riot process might be somebody coming in to observe me and to mm-hmm. speak. Am I calling on certain students and not others? Am I reacting a certain way to certain, you know, what am, have I created a safe environment for all of my students? And so if we look at that, while we're problem solving as a team, we can identify trends or other factors that might be influencing those outcomes. And, and PLTs also have access to the equity impact analysis. There are questions there which help us during problem solving by providing a set of guiding questions to determine if the actions we're proposing or the policies or programs or even our practices or decisions we're making, if those are likely creating, maintaining, or increasing opportunity gaps for our marginalized students. And so we have these resources that we can share with our PLTs and within that PLT doing tips, all of these things come into play. And so our PLT guidelines also provide guiding questions that ask who benefited from my instruction today and who didn't and why? And all of those help us address potential biases. Team initiated problem solving helps us to see blind spots we may not otherwise see if we're trying to problem solve solo. So having the team initiated process, having a team with all those different lenses helps us to circumvent some of that. Thank you, Sandy. As you're talking about those team, you know, persons coming together to talk about how they view the data. You know, it just remind me of um, when we get the chance as teachers to observe other teachers' classroom. So not yeah. just sitting in team meetings and just looking at it. the chance to walk through yes. and see what's really going on and say, is that what I'm seeing in this classroom? Is this going on in my classroom? So I like that um, whole idea of the team initiated problem solving. So Mickey, from your lens, What do teachers need to support their data journey? So from my lens, I think the first thing that I think of when um, data journeys that teachers go through is they need to have access to data. And it needs to be timely and relevant. And it needs to be in in a format that is conducive to their database problem solving. I think that's the first thing they need to have to that. In fact, when we talk about MTSS and we look at implementation of MTSS, one things one of the things that we ask is, do teachers have access to data? And if so, how and when and where? I think another piece that we think about for MTSS coaches is, how can we help support 
our, our PLTs, and how do we help support our schools with effectively analyzing data? And what does that sound like and look like? And that might be that we help them with uh, identifying protocols to use. It might be that we offer coaching and support with that so they can effectively use tips when they are analyzing the data. I also think that there needs to be time. And I know time is precious, (laughs) but I also know that time speaks to what we value. I really have to give a shout out to those schools that have built into their schedule, whether it be their PLT schedule or their master schedule, a block of time. And I'm not talking about 45 minutes. I'm talking about an hour and a half to two hours periodically throughout the year where that PLT can sit down and effectively look at their data and think about what is this data telling us and how do we use this data to inform our instruction and how are we going to respond to those students that are not meeting our benchmarks and why are they not meeting our benchmark? And I think finally, the biggest piece of that data journey is we, you know, talk about being data rich and we have lots of data here in Wake County. And I think schools have a lot of pieces of data, helping them to identify what is the relevant piece of data that we need at this moment, at this time. And then that now what piece? So we've got the data We've analyzed the data, so now what? What are we going to do with it? It gets it past that admiring the data and really thinking about this is what we have in front of us and this is what we need to do to address those instructional practices that meets the needs of all of our students. And I can say in terms of that access to the data, I think that's a spot where DRA can help with um, our own acronym, SOAR. Y'all recall what SOAR stands for? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see what that guy does. <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> wait. Um, is it student outcome ad hoc report? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Ad hoc. Yep. There we go. Um, I know what so DRA far. stands for. <laughs> um, as a place where, where teachers can access um, their yes. data and kind of filter just for the pieces that they need that's going to help in that process. Because, yeah, yep. data rich sometimes can become data overwhelmed. Yes. Everything all at once. The ability to pick and choose just the pieces you need. And we'll put in the show notes some resources for SOAR and FIPO files in, files out as well to help people out. Yeah. I liked uh, Mickey's, I like that he mentioned the whole access. Mm. So the who has data, right? Yeah. Because for a lot of times, it, it felt as though when you're in the classroom that teachers have the least access to data yeah. or they yes. have the most access to student learning data, but everything else, they don't have all of the other pieces mm-hmm. and you have to rely on a, an administrator to get data. So I like that thing about access when and where, and I like that, that your point about relevancy, like, you know, I, I was thinking when you said that, well, it all depends on the question that I'm asking, the hypothesis exactly. that I've developed. Yeah. Which is why again, moving to Sandy's point, why it is important to kind of go through the entire process to make sure that you have the most relevant and the quote unquote right data yeah. for the question that you're trying to pursue. And I hear um, Sandy touch on this as well about interpreting. And then Mickey talked about the analyzing of it. So we can have all the data in the world, but if we're taking that wrong interpretation to what the data is, that's going to be a problem for us. So yes. I like how you mentioned that it's about analyzing. So having the access to it is one, but analyzing it correctly, that is also important. Yes. And I think it uh, goes back to, like I said just a moment ago, you know, having those protocols uh, in place. And a lot of times Sandy and I may work with a grade level chair or we may work with a specific PLT or maybe the, the instructional facilitator to help say, Here's a good protocol that you could use to go to what you were just saying to help you with the analyzing that piece of data. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a lot of protocols out there and but you need to be able to give them the right one on to help them to get to that point of that analyzing of the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll I'll say one other resource perhaps is is just the the different people like y'all, the wonderful MTSS coaches or us within uh, DRA to kind of help schools as they work through this. Yes. Yes. Mickey, I like how you advocate for carving out time. And when you do so, feel free to send us a message, you know, be it your department or ours or anyone else to kind of help people through these protocols, through these systems to make sure that. Like Sandy mentioned earlier, you're getting the biggest bang for your buck with that time that you are carving out. Sure. Yeah. 
one of the ways that you can get in touch with us for the Data Lit Podcast is through our website at www.wcpss.net slash data lit. And there you can send us a message. You can also uh, check out the show notes there, and we'll put some resources from the MTSS coaches and from us at DRA for different places where you can dive in a little bit deeper to these ideas. You can uh, also check out some past series on that site as well. In future episodes for this series, we're going to talk to some other Wake County staff members, some teachers, some administrators, as we look a little bit more about what does it mean to work with data. Another big thanks to Sandy Carter and Mickey Gerganis for joining us. Thank you. So welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to Cary High School's Logan Foster for providing the theme music for this series. And we look forward to talking to you all next time about working with data. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.